Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Osama and I'm serving as the resident chaplain for Muslim space, whether you are joining us here in our virtual space or you are seeing this in the future, inshallah. Uh, we welcome you to our fourth halakha on uh, civic justice in Islam as part of our Upholders of Justice series. And before I give you a little bit of insight into our series, uh, just a little bit about our space and uh, Muslim space. We are a community organization that is serving the greater Austin area. Uh, we strive to provide an open and welcoming environment to all self-identifying Muslims, as well as those connected to or interested in Islam who wish to gather, unite, and support one another through various programming and community events. And since COVID-19, we've actually aimed to make our events and activities more accessible and inclusive to folks outside of Austin. And uh, this halakha attests to that. And we've had people participate and join our activities from all over the globe. And there's no limitation to that for us. And so we make it a point to be an inclusive and welcoming community space where any and all are invited regardless of difference in faith, gender, sexual orientation, race, or any other difference. And so tonight's series, uh, our halakha specifically today, will look at uh, civic justice in Islam. And what it comes from for our series here is uh, on upholders of justice is that oftentimes we think of justice, we think of it in the context of the world that we live in today, we automatically jump to thinking of movements of social justice, fighting oppression, uh, activism, and other rich examples of what it is like to see justice manifested. And uh, in Islam, Muslims are enjoined to not just be just, but upholders of justice, even if it is against ourselves. As stated in the Quran in Surah Nisa, that, O ye who believed, be persistently for, uh, standing firm in justice, be upholders of justice, witnesses for Allah, even if it is against yourself, your parents, your relative or nearest of kin. And so for this specific halakha, as I mentioned, we're going to look into civic justice uh, in being citizens of this nation while simultaneously having obligations both religiously and civically towards bettering our society as well as upholding justice. And so this in this series, therefore, we strive to better understand the holistic justice that we as Muslims have as an obligation uh, towards not just ourselves, but to one another and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, the series will be recorded to YouTube and it will be live streamed to Facebook and it will remain accessible for all attendees today and anyone who cannot make it. Uh, so just some quick housekeeping rules before we introduce our speaker. Please, uh, for the duration of the halakha, uh, please remain muted and have your mics muted. Uh, if you have any questions that come up at any point during the lecture, please, uh, you are most welcome to put them in the chat uh, or you can message them to me and we'll keep note of them for the Q&A time. Uh, and we'll bring them back during our question and answer period. And please keep this discourse, uh, any discourse respectful to the speaker as well as all attendees. Again, this is a uh, sacred space that we lift up uh, each time that we hold this event. And so we'll be having somebody just keeping, keeping an eye on that. So we just request everybody to, uh, to uphold that uh, aspect, giving justice to your fellow attendees. Uh, and if there's any concerns uh, at any point, please don't hesitate to message me. Uh, and we'll take care of it. But uh, for our speaker tonight, uh, Sister Wada Khalid is a policy analyst. She's a career coach and public speaker based in Washington, DC. She has significant experience working on refugee, immigration, civil rights, foreign affairs, and national security issues on Capitol Hill at the United Nations and with secular and faith-based NGOs. She founded Polygon Education Fund, a national civic education and advocacy organization dedicated to strengthening American Muslim engagement with Congress and currently serves as senior policy advisor at the Office of Refugee Resettlement in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Previously, she has served as senior media advisor at Rethink Media, where she worked with Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian groups and activists on the 20th commemoration of 9-11. She also consulted for Islamic Scholarship Fund, placing Muslim interns and fellows on Capitol Hill. Warda was uh, recognized by ABC's Nightline as one of the country's top millennial activists. Her writing and commentary has been featured in outlets including the Washington Post, CNN, The Guardian, and NPR. 
and she authored the Young American Muslim blog for the Houston Chronicle and hosted Reality Check on One Legacy Radio. Huerta holds a, a master's in international affairs from Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. And uh, additionally, Huerta is a CPA and received a BBA in uh, an MS in accounting from Texas A&M University. As a, as a University of Texas Longhorn, that pains me, but uh, it's uh, alhamdulillah just reading all this. It's, uh, it's, it's a blessing to have you in our space, Sister Huerta. Um, welcome. And without further ado, please, uh, the uh, stage is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Brother Osama, for that introduction and for having me. I'm so excited to be back in Texas virtually um, speaking with you all. And yes, I know we are rivals with a &M and University of Texas, but it's okay. We can get along, um, at least for this session today. So um, thank you all for being here, for being interested in this topic. This is one that's very near and dear to my heart. So I was really excited when Brother Osama asked me to come speak about it with you all. And, um, you know, I like to keep my sessions pretty interactive. So if you have questions as we're going through, as Brother Osama said, please feel free to put them in the chat. I will answer them as I see them. Um, or if he wants to, you know, flag me to stop to answer them, if it's really relevant to something that I'm saying at that time, that's fine too. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the session, we'll also have time for Q&A. Um, and so you'll have time then to ask anything as well. And I want to be as helpful as possible and kind of share with you my perspective, um, you know, of how I have been trying to live civic justice and Islam and how I understand the topic. So let me see. Are you able to enable screen sharing for me so I can share um, a PowerPoint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. You should be good to go right now. All right. Great. All right, can everybody see my PowerPoint? Yes, okay, awesome. All right, this is not a super long PowerPoint, it's just some visuals because I know I get um, bored if I don't have something visual to look at as a visual learner. So this is just to help you visual learners out there. Um, so as I said, my name is Wartha Khalid. Um, I'm based here in Washington, DC, but I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Um, and I have been working in this space for over the last 10 years. Um, you know, I got really involved in this work starting in college when I was a sister social officer in the Muslim Students Association and really was trying to bring the community together um, and understood later as I was graduating um, how Islamophobia was starting to play into uh, President Obama's election, how it was affecting the lives of Muslims across the U.S., and how that tied into foreign policy. So I'll talk a little bit more of my background in a bit, but that's kind of how I got into this space. And as you heard in my introduction, I actually changed my career to work into this space. I'm very, very passionate about it. So why civic engagement? You know, why do we talk about civic justice? Well, um, to start with, you know, it is an Islamic duty to uphold justice and to be an active agent of change. And this could be either an internal, um, self, you know, striving against yourself or external, which is in the society that you live in. Um, and I have a, a Quranic verse here from Surah Nisa that says, O ye who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah, even as against yourselves or your parents or your kin, and whether it be against rich or poor. Um, and, and, you know, I think this verse is really um, important in demonstrating that point that you know, this is something that our religion calls us to do. And it's something that we should take pride in as Muslims that, hey, we come from a faith that really values justice and values equality and, um, you know, doesn't believe in this preferential treatment or that one person is better than another person. It's a very unique thing. And it's something that we should um, remember when we're going about our daily lives, whether that is, um, you know, handling how we are interacting with others or ourselves. And one particular quote that really inspires me in my action that I do is this hadith below by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu saying, well, whosoever of you sees an evil action, let him change it with his hand. And if he's not able to do so, then with his tongue. And if he's not able to do so, then with his heart. And that is the weakest of faith. And I really like this hadith because it gives options to the believer, right? So you know, depending on where you are in a situation or your comfort level um, or how much impact you can make or the way you can make impact, you have different options that each count as, you know, taking action against an evil. Um, and from there on, it's your, your way to do it. And obviously it's saying the best 
way is to, you know, change it with your hand or your tongue. But even if you're not allowed to do that, you know, make the waffer, the oppressed or where you want to see change. Um, and, and that is still a way to show faith. All right, so I mentioned I would talk a little bit about my story and how I got into this. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, Islamophobia was really ramping up around the time that I graduated from college with President Obama's election. And, you know, I really had this desire, even before I started college, to go and work in D.C. or in New York at the United Nations to make good policy. Um, I don't know if I just saw a picture of Madeleine Albright as like the first secretary, woman secretary of state, and was like, I want that job or what it was that inspired me, but I really kind of had this desire, or it could be growing up as the daughter of immigrants and always hearing about foreign policy at home. I just felt like, hey, you know, there needs to be people that look like me that are in these institutions making these changes. And I think that became really clear, um, you know, around that time where we were seeing people marginalized Muslims, Arabs, people who thought they were, you know, um, Arab or Muslims, we were involved in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we were really, as the U.S. and as even the Western um, kind of countries, were looking at Muslim majority countries or the Muslim world, as they call it, um, not through a human lens, but more through like a militaristic or Orientalist lens. And as somebody who grew up in Texas and was a proud Texan, like many Texans, but also identified as a practicing Muslim, alhamdulillah, I felt like I was in a very unique position to kind of help try to bridge that gap. And the way that I wanted to do it was through policy. And I got involved at the local level first. Um, I was volunteering with a local care chapter. I helped create a youth program for them. I was a MENA camp counselor. I was writing my religion blog for the Houston Chronicle and eventually decided that it was time for me to really pursue my passion full time and um, change my career from working as a corporate tax accountant, uh, moved to New York, went to graduate school and got a second master's in international affairs and then moved shortly to DC after and, and started my career here. So as you can see in my bio, I've done a lot of different things, um, but always at the center of my work is this you know, civic justice is, you know, working for equality and human rights. And my concentration in grad school actually was human rights and humanitarian affairs. And that's always at the center of my work. Um, and so as a disclaimer, I'm here speaking in my personal capacity, not in my government position or any other position that I'm in. But I want you to know this background because, you know, people ask me sometimes like, oh, how can I do this work myself? But it's really about starting in your local community and seeing what injustices you see there or opportunities to create justice that you see there. And then, you know, working at a broader scale if you want, but there is so much work to be done at the local level as well that I really, um, you know, I think people see people working at the national scale and that's the only thing you can you do and that's not it at all. Austin is a very diversity with a lot of, I'm sure, local issues, state issues, the capital is there that you can work on. So, uh, you know, wherever you are in the country is a place to start doing the civic justice. So the first way that we talked about is justice against ourselves, right? So this is against your nafs or your ego and how are you actually treating, um, you know, people that you interact with? How are you treating yourself? So it's not just, we often think that this is about protests and the things that we see on TV or, you know, going to the hill and advocating or doing something like that, but it's a holistic approach that Islam takes and that includes yourself and the world and the community in which you live. So for yourself or personal relationships, thinking about, you know, how are you treating your coworkers, your friends and families? Are your interactions just? Are you thinking about how you can take advantage of people? Are you thinking about how you can get the better deal? Um, or are you treating them like you would wanna treat yourself, right? Um, or are you treating people with compassion? Are you treating, giving them the 70 excuses that we talk about? Um, how are you, uh, how are your relationships with yourself and with others? And for yourself, you know, do you hold yourself accountable when it's time to, when there is some sort of error in judgment that you made, or maybe a mistake that you made, do you hold yourself accountable or do you think that, oh no, I'm above that? Um, do you treat yourself with compassion when it comes time to treat yourself with compassion if you have been through a hard time? Um, and then this desire of the ego to be right, you know, this is something that we are uh, is built into us. How do you humble yourself? How do you make sure that you are just uh, with yourself and with others? So that's what it kind of means when it talks about justice against ourselves. And this could also mean people within your own community, right? So say you're talking about the Muslim community or the Austin community or whatever community you identify with. 
Um, you know, and sometimes your community might be in the wrong or your family might be in the wrong or your uh, organization might be in the wrong. And are you able to look at that objectively and with justice, a uh, justice lens and be able to be accountable for that, right? So um, it's all things, yourself, your community and, and going out as well. Just to get justice against the external. So this is what we often think when we talk about um, doing justice work. So we're thinking about movements of social justice. We're thinking about fighting oppression, activism that we see, um, and other rich examples where we believe justice can be manifested. And you know, right now um, you can find these people a lot of times in social media, on Twitter. They're really active, talking about the latest issue. Um, there are so many issues in the U.S to work on and around the world, whether it be poverty, whether it be climate change um, and you know, um, you know, equal employment opportunities. There are so many examples of injustice that we see in the world, minimum wage, um, you know, depending on where you are in the world. If you're a teacher, you might see injustice in education. Um, you know, if you work for a, a nonprofit versus corporate, maybe you see some room for improvement there. So there's always places depending on where you want in your life to work and create improvement and fight for justice, then, and you don't necessarily have to be an activist per se to do that, right? Um, an activist is somebody who's kind of doing this as like their full-time job or a big you know, portion of their time is used for fighting injustice, but you can fight injustice every single day, even in the small sphere that you um, occupy. Um, I give Black Lives Matter as an example because Muslims are actually the uh, largest faith group to support Black Lives Matter, which um, I think is great because racial injustice is something that the U.S. has struggled with since its inception, right? And um, starting with a history of slavery um, to even right now within our own community, in the Muslim community, we have racism that we had to reckon with during the Black Lives Matter movement. So I think that's a great example of both internal and external jihad where you're taking accountability for your community and saying like, hey, how are we treating the people that are black or African uh, or of African descent that come that are part of our community versus the larger racial injustices that we see in the systems of the country in the US, um, whether it be how they're treated in the workplace, whether it be how they're treated by law enforcement um, or they're treated in the education sphere. Um, and so I thought that was a really good example of, of of these two kind of dynamics about justice against yourselves and justice against the other. Um, I, I gave other examples like fair wage is something, you know, a lot of the Muslim community actually lives um, at or below the poverty level line. And we often don't think about them because we think about Muslims being successful engineers and doctors and lawyers. And yes, alhamdulillah, we have a lot of those in our community, but there's also many people that are struggling out there. And, you know, keeping those people in mind when we're making policies when making tax policies, for example, um, is really important. And I remember a few years ago, I think it was President Trump who changed the tax uh, code. And that was actually going to affect, I think it was like 70% of Muslims or something like that negatively. So it was a very large number. Um, and you can find that number on the on the Polygon website because I don't want to misquote it. But it just goes to show how our community is impacted not only by foreign affairs issues, which I think is often a misconception that people that work in policy think is that we only care about foreign affairs, but domestic issues affect us just like they do every other American. Um, and so that is a, a great way to put your interests in. Um, and for you in, in, in your person, one way that you can get engaged is you know through civic engagement, which is through the civic engagement process, right? So I talk here about you know get out the vote campaigns or working to vote. Um, attending town hall meetings or meetings uh, with your representatives, whether they're in Congress or whether they are in your um, uh, you know, state and local government is, is really important. One thing that I learned you know, through my work um, at Polygon is we did a study actually of what is the current level of civic engagement for American Muslims in the, um, when it comes to the, to the national level. And we found that actually Muslims were the least engaged group. Now this was a 2019, 2018 study, but they were the least engaged of all faith groups when it came to meeting with your representatives. Um, at the congressional level, that number was, I believe only like 17 or 13%. I'm forgetting the exact, exact statistic. I think it was 17%. 
And for meeting with your state and local official, it was only 20%. Um, and I think that was a difficult <laughs> concept to grapple with, but we were not surprised, but it's still tough to see, right? Like there's so much opportunity there and it really explains why our community is treated the way it is. And I'll go into that in a little bit, but I just want you to know that there was room for improvement. And um, a recent study I saw that now, Alhamdulillah, Muslims are actually the most likely faith group to attend town hall meetings. So we turned that around and there is no reason why we can't turn the other things around and really capitalize on our collective power, right? Because we are stronger when we work together. And I think that's what these movements show. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was working for justice, both inside and outside government. So right now I'm working inside government and I worked previously on Capitol Hill as well, which is in the federal government. Um, but previously I worked outside government, um, working at advocacy organizations, and um, I still sit on the board of an advocacy organization. And both of these ways have their uh, methods of achieving justice, um, both inside and outside the system, as people like to call it. For instance, I talk about the Department of Justice has a civil rights division where their job literally is to uphold civil rights in the US. And you know, if there are discrimination claims or anything like that, they investigate those uh, claims. Um, there is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. There's so many um, places where you can work for justice. Of course, there's places where things are not um, positive or perhaps, uh, you know, depending on the administration and who you're working for and all that. But on those cases, then sometimes you can make an impact outside, right? It's like really pressuring policymakers to do the right thing, uh, really ed educating people about what's going on inside. Um, and so there's different ways to do that. And so the way that I um, do this is through Polygon Education Fund, the organization that um, was mentioned earlier that I founded. And that was really to teach Muslims how to engage with Congress. I was working at a Quaker lobby, and I don't know if you're familiar with Quakers, but they're a smaller Christian group of less than 75,000 people in the US, but they have immense lobbying power here in the US. And so when I came to DC for the first time to work, I actually got a fellowship with them and I was able to learn how they teach their constituents how to lobby, how they're educating their constituents about different issues that are happening. And they range from everything from criminal justice reform to Native American rights to foreign policy. And so I was sitting here working on foreign policy issues as an American Muslim for a Quaker organization. And so I thought to myself, you know, why does my community not have something like this? We're three to 8 million people, way more than 75,000. And we are not um, you know, lobbying in this united way to show people power when we come to Congress. And so that's really what inspired me to start Polygon, um, you know, put together a great team of people to help bring that vision to life. Um, back in 2017 is when we launched. So this year, alhamdulillah, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary, hopefully many more to come inshallah, but it just really shows the importance of getting engaged um, because you know, we do go around teaching people how to advocate with their members of Congress. How do you attend town hall meetings? How do you do a phone call? And this is just our way of advocating outside of government, but sometimes we also do work with government like members of Congress to introduce bills and things like that that can improve the lives of American Muslims. Um, yes, as a reminder, if you have any questions that come up, put them in the chat and um, we'll answer them either at the end uh, or during as well. Okay. So this is an example of me kind of advocating outside. Um, this was actually, uh, I think this is a post that Brother Osama uh, reached out to me about. Um, and this was, I don't know if you guys remember, but right around the time where the Afghanistan withdrawal was happening in September, um, you know, people started coming up with this thing called Texas Taliban. And they were trying to use the rhetoric to describe uh, an anti-abortion policy that was um, taking place at the state house um, or in the state, uh, yeah, in the state house or the state senate, I can't remember, in Texas. And so people thought it would be really clever to call those lawmakers Texas Taliban because they were being oppressive toward women and aren't the Taliban oppressive toward women too. And, you know, people thought it was super clever. But the problem with this is that Sometimes when you think that you're actually helping a cause, you can harm a completely different community. And I, I was upset that people were using Texas Taliban because this was a purely American issue that was happening. This was a Texas issue. 
why are you bringing people from Afghanistan into your internal domestic politics? And Muslims and Afghans are already, you know, brown people in general are seen as backwards or oppressive toward women or are seen as, you know, not unjust or, um, you know, just barbaric. And the, this hashtag was perpetuating that myth. And, you know, to play devil's advocate or what some people were saying was, well, you know, we know that the Taliban doesn't represent Islam. So why are you making this about Islam? But the thing is that most people don't know that. Most people do identify the Taliban with Islam or with an Islamic country. So if you have this hashtag trending, then people are going to start associating Islam with what's happening in Texas, with anti-abortion laws, and with oppression of women. And that is dangerous. Islamophobia in general is dangerous because it puts people's lives at risk um, because people can be targeted for being Muslim because of these negative stereotypes about them and about their religion. So I put a, a post out um, about that. And you know, this is something again, where I saw an opportunity, you know, I'm a Muslim woman. I'm also from Texas and I you know, disagree with this abortion law Whereas, you know, in Islam, I, and I mentioned this, we have a more nuanced view on abortion. It's not completely banned like this law was trying to do. And I didn't appreciate the conversation that people were trying to say by bringing Islam into the conversation. Um, and I think that's important. The way that we talk about things matters. And as somebody who has done a lot of article writing and op-eds and media work, this was just something that I could do in my circle of influence. Um, and so the ACLU picked it up and they have a very big reach and they shared it on their Instagram and their Twitter. And thankfully I started hearing conversations from people who were in my circles that worked at like the State Department for instance or other places who originally thought this was a cute, clever hashtag understand that, oh, okay, like maybe we should rethink this or this is actually not accurate and we shouldn't be throwing another community under the bus whether that's justified or not to describe something that's purely a domestic American issue that has nothing to do with Islam. So that was, you know, why I did this. And I think it was effective. And so sometimes just speaking out and writing, you know, changing things with your tongue, as we would say, can be a very effective to educate people, way to educate people, even those who don't mean harm, but they just don't know that the message that they are spreading or that they're seeing actually causes real harm and is inaccurate. The other thing I wanna talk about is working for justice, not just when it's politically convenient. And this is, these two bills um, were voted on last night. So I don't know if you guys are aware, but last night um, in the House of Representatives, um, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar had a Islamophobia bill that was being voted on. And the bill essentially would establish an office at the State Department to measure and track Islamophobia around the world. Um, and it would, uh, you know, have a way for there to be kind of uh, accountability when certain countries were perpetuating Islamophobia or we were seeing it in our very own country. And it was important because um, I believe there's also like an anti-Semitism office there. And so we needed one for Muslims is, is kind of what she was saying. And the, the Republican talking points for this were really sad. Um, so you, members come on the floor to either support or, um, you know, support the bill or encourage their fellow colleagues not to vote for the bill. And so we saw Republicans over and over again saying things like, oh, well, we don't have a definition of Islamophobia. So what is this talking about? Or, you know, nobody wants, uh, you know, Muslims to be discriminated against. But, you know, why, you know, why are we drawing attention to this? And so, it, it was just very um, disappointing to see that, you know, they have Muslim constituents, they call up Muslim members of Congress to ask them how to talk to those Muslim constituents, but when it comes time to vote for them, they don't want to create this institutional tool that will actually help Muslims. Well, literally right after this vote happened, and, and, and the vote passed, by the way, because the Democrats have a majority in the House, and so it passed, Right after that, there was a bipartisan piece of legislation that also passed that was talking about Uyghur forced labor. Labor. This is also an Islamophobic issue, and it was so funny to see the same politicians that were speaking against the Islamophobia bill 
talking about how important it was to pass this bill for Uyghur human rights and how people shouldn't be persecuted for their faith and they shouldn't have forced labor. And it was just purely politics, right? And that's why I say when it's not political convenient because those people were not being consistent with their values. On one hand, they were fine with Islamophobia, you know, not being a, an office in that in in the State Department where people could educate people, but they were okay with censuring China because it's politically convenient to do so right now. Um, and so this is what our faith teaches us is to be consistent and not worry about the external, not just when it's politically convenient, we should always do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Um, and so that's what civic justice in Islam is about. And um, that example was, a, was the exact opposite um, where people were doing things because it was politically convenient and, it, and it's sad. It was just really sad. Um, and now both bills are going to be going to the Senate to be voted on. And I'm guessing that the one on the right, the one that's targeting China, will pass, while the Islamophobia one may not, um, because uh, right now Democrats have a majority in the Senate. And if this doesn't have bipartisan support in the House, it's going to be difficult to pass it in the Senate, too. So, um, yeah. And this is especially true given that recently, you know, Congresswoman Omar faced Islamophobic comments herself um, by a fellow member of Congress. And um, we saw another member of Congress last night saying she wasn't gonna vote for the bill because she didn't support a religion whose ideology was to dominate the world and kill infidels, which is just you know completely wrong, obviously, but also just very inflammatory and sends the wrong message. And again, puts people's lives in danger. And so these are the kinds of efforts that we're trying to speak out against because words matter. and. Um, unfortunately, the tone gets set from the top, and so we have to we have to push back. Okay, so I will stop there for questions. If there's any topic you want me to expand on, let me know. I know that was a kind of a quick overview, um, but I wanted to leave enough time to discuss. Um, somebody asked a question: Is why Middle Eastern is still classified as white? I assume you mean like on the census. That is a really good question. Um, I actually got to work on the census a bit when I worked on the Hill and um, racial, uh, you know, first of all, it was a whole um, effort to include communities of color in the census, right? Because if you don't know, census not only um, measures the number of people that are living in America, but also depending on how many people are in each city or county, it gives federal and state resources, meaning money, to support community programs in those areas, libraries, uh, schools, things like that. Um, and so if you don't have an accurate count, some communities are gonna be underfunded versus communities that are accurately reporting and they're gonna get the majority of the resources. So part of that is the challenges of getting people of color included in the census. And then for your question about why Middle Easterns are filed as white, it's true. Um, for, you know, since, I guess maybe since they came, they've been classified as white. And there actually was a, an effort this year to create a Middle Eastern category on the census. It did not happen, but maybe inshallah it'll happen um, for the next one, which will be 10 years from now. And they were making the exact same argument that you know, communities of color are not being counted as such, and they are, um, you know, not being given the resources that they should get in their community. Some some Arabs I know will mark other, you know, and then just write it in. So that is something that you could do if that's how um, you feel like you could be represented. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of issues with the way that we racially categorize ourselves just overall. Um, I mean, even with like Asian, uh, South Asian and East Asian, Central Asian are all classified in one in, in one part and those cultures are and ethnicities are so different. So, you know, it's 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 just a whole messed up situation. <laughs> other questions? Yeah, we got one, uh, a couple other ones that have been uh, coming in. I think Shadi just came in right after we've got one that was messaged right before um, that said, uh, for your presentation. Um, oftentimes, as uh, Muslims, whether during elections or other significant political events, we're often given the lesser of two evils excuse um, when we it comes down to a choice uh, for our convictions and 
where we feel torn between those choices, but we also feel at odds with our faith obligations um, and our faith values. How do we navigate certain situations? Do we just capitulate to the lesser of two evils, or is there another way that we can navigate the situation? That's a really good question. I think the answer depends on what your strategic end goal is, right? So um, it's a lesser of two evils is often a, a choice that we make in American politics, because let's be honest, the establishment does not re represent the people very well. This is a well-known fact among both political parties. And oftentimes they're the ones that become the political candidates that we have to choose from. And oftentimes, we are saying things like lesser of two evils in order to um, try to have a chance in order to make our voice heard, right? So it's like, which candidate is actually going to listen to me versus which candidate has already shut the door and are not interested? In that case, the lesser of two evils is voting for the candidate that's not perfect, but will actually give your community a chance to have its voice heard. So if that's a strategic end goal of pushing your community's policy agenda and you can do it with one particular candidate, then, you, then that might be the way that you wanna vote. I have seen people get really stuck on this question because they are so concerned that the values do not align and they are perfectly entitled to do that. However, I would encourage them to think about what end goal are they accomplishing with that? Yes, they are staying true to their own principles, but in doing so, are they actually going to bring on a candidate that's not going to listen to them at all um, but they just happen to agree on this one issue that's really, really important to them. So it's tough. It's tough because there's no perfect person or policy or, um, uh, yeah, there's no perfect person or policy that exists anywhere. You're not going to 100% agree with someone on everything, even if it's within your own community. So I think taking a calculated kind of measured objective approach and saying, okay, what is my end goal? What is this person in this position supposed to focus on? If they're focusing on, um, I don't know, like uh, like city wastewater or something, is it really important that we don't 100% uh, agree on um, an issue of like, I don't know, like food safety or something like that? Um, you know, what am I willing to live with? And what is what do I need to do to be able to have somebody here who is the best person who will represent my views the best on on the issue that they're working on. So it's delicate. I know our community gets really divided about particular issues, but that's just the way that I've been able to navigate it. Um, and and the way that I see that how politics actually works. You know, even people who are um, Republicans and Democrats or independents across the aisle they don't all agree on everything that's in those bills that they signed on to, but it's enough to, for them to say that, okay, this is enough for me to just be able to put my name on this, to pass this for my broader, the broader objective that we're trying to reach. Um, we saw that a lot with the COVID relief packages um, where people wanted different things, even now with the family leave stuff, Build Back Better, all of those things had so many compromises. So we're not the only community that's dealing with that and everybody is dealing with making that choice. Excellent. Thank you for that answer. And uh, I think this is just uh, a, a follow up to that. And then uh, Sister Shadi had, had come up there. So I want to honor that. But um, this was a follow up that was put to that, that uh, does that response as well, uh, you know, go for uh, when we go about coalition building with allies or mm -hmm. enter into partnerships or uh, enter into alliances with individuals who might align with us on certain goals yeah. and aims, but who also do have maybe some notable, uh, you know, Islamophobic beliefs or yeah. activity, whether salient or underlying, does this uh, fall in line in the same regard? Or how do we navigate those kinds of relationships? That's a really good question. Again, this is going to depend on the organization or the person that's making that decision. But I think one principle that's good to use is if that potential partner is causing harm to your community. Um, so if it is an Islamophobic organization and let's say you agree on one other issue, is it worth it for you to partner with that organization, support them, give them legitimacy in your community if at the end of the day, they're still gonna harm you through, I don't know, passing Islamophobic legislation or speaking ill against Muslims. Um, that's, a, that's a personal decision that you have to make. And there are ways to address that 
you know, internal communication, trying to talk to them directly about their problematic positions and seeing if you can help sway that. But sometimes there are points where you're just going to disagree and it's a, it's a calculated um, decision about whether the net, the interaction is a net positive or if it's a negative, or if you're so, um, you know, feeling so strongly in your views that you absolutely cannot partner with somebody who doesn't ag agree with you, then that's fine too. That's your, that's your prerogative. So you just have to decide if it's worth it, um, you know, to, to work with somebody that doesn't align on, on every value. And I think one good way to think about that is the harm that they're causing and, and what, how does it impact you or your community? Definitely, thank you. Um, I guess Shadia's questions, uh, the next one up and then uh, Savia's right up to that. Sure. Um, okay, I see Shadia's, what has been the biggest difficulty faced from working with a Muslim community and what optimistic surprises have you encountered? Uh, I think I think this question actually that you just asked has been the biggest difficulty when working within the Muslim community is people are um, hesitant to work with others if they don't 100% align with each other's views. Um, and this can be problematic because then we spend so much time infighting that we're not progressing on, an, on a national or state or local scale, depending on wherever you're working, to push for positive policy change. So I think that and, and we're not the only community that does that. Every community has their own disagreements. We're not special in that effect, but that's just what I've personally seen is that sometimes they're hesitant to work with others. There's also working in silos that I see a lot, um, not wanting to give other organizations or people credit because they want to keep getting the credit for something, even though they worked with others to do that. And this is just, you know, this unjust behavior to go with the, with the topic that we're talking about is, you know, uh, God is going to know who did what. He's going to know who, who is working on things, regardless of what you're telling people. Um, and so at the end of the day, you have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And so I think centering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, centering your values and your mission is really important to staying grounded in this space because it can be very easy to get caught up in the drama or the things where even now we just saw the story last night of the Cairo, Ohio person who was working undercover for you know an Islamophobe. And those are scary things that can happen. And I don't know what the situation was that happened or what caused that. I think we'll probably find out, but you never know if everybody's working with the right intention. And um, I think the key to longevity in this game, especially in the public service game is working for the right intention. I do not think you will last very long if you're not in it for the right reason. So I think community and fighting and working in silos is probably the biggest difficulty. Um, and some optimistic surprises I've encountered. Um, there's been a lot of optimistic things. I think people's willingness to work together once they get to know each other on a personal level has been uh, refreshing to see. Um, people that you thought would never work together or previously, you know, organizations that didn't like each other. When there is a common goal, they will sit at the table together and, and work on it. So I think sometimes remembering what you have in common versus what are your differences can be really uh, helpful and effective. And so that's something that um, I've enjoyed. And then I think that just meeting people um, in different cities across the US where I've done advocacy trainings and seeing how interested people are and see how much they want to support civic engagement and how they're starting to understand that voting is the base level of civic engagement, right? And we want to increase that and start you know, holding the people that we're voting into office accountable. Um, that has been really refreshing to see how every year, every election cycle, the community has done better and better in, in being engaged. And so that's really great. But um, yeah, we've seen, we've seen lots of successes um, where we voted in, you know, candidates that we really like. Uh, we've been able to work together and create partnerships and products that maybe we not, would not have 20, 30 years ago. So I see us improving and I see um, these Hill Days that people are doing. So Polygon has trained a lot of different organizations before their Hill Days, uh, where they go to Capitol Hill and they meet with a member of Congress, which is great. We should just be doing it 365 days a year, not just one day a year. But even having that is, is really exciting to see. So um, yeah, that makes me opt optimistic about the future. Um, the next question I say, <laughs> I just, address your question. Since you mentioned the Quaker community and their expertise in engaging the community in legislative advocacy, what are your thoughts on having Muslims be 
more engaged with interfaith efforts at legislative advocacy. Uh, I've been in meetings and Muslim leaders keep saying we need to be more like the Jewish lobby, but we work in a vacuum and often read on the wheel and we could just partner with other groups with whom we have shared values or even those we don't always agree on, for example, about foreign policy to work on issues we do agree on. I feel like we end up not wanting to play well with other groups, but in the process, we shoot our own goals in the foot. Yeah, I, I, I did kind of address this. Um, but yeah, I, I have worked at several Christian organizations. The first one was with the Quakers and the second one was a church world service doing refugee and immigration advocacy. I did not feel like my Muslim values uh, disagreed with what I was working on. In fact, I think there was very strong alignment of justice, equality, pluralism, standing up for the underprivileged, uh, standing up for the marginalized and oppressed that really resonated with both faith traditions. And if you think about it, they're both Abrahamic traditions that come from the same place. So we're gonna have a lot of intersecting values that align. So I think absolutely interfaith advocacy is good. All these coalitions, uh, for instance, that Polygon works on, we're in a voting rights coalition, right? Where we work with Jewish organizations on hunger issues. We work with Christian organizations on making sure that people have the right to vote and that oppressive voter policies are opposed. Um, like I said, even within the Muslim community, it's gonna be hard to find people that you agree with um, on every single issue. I think the key is just making sure that the people that you are um, working with, whether it's across the aisle, are not harming your community with some of their other policies. Um, next question, do you still practice as a CPA? Um, no, I do not practice as a CPA. I still have my license. I still do my parents' taxes, my taxes. Um, but no, I'm not working um, as a CPA. I have my license in case I ever feel like I want to go back to it. But actually, in my current job, I've been doing a lot of spreadsheets and Excel work. And I am also with managing um, Polygon. I do a lot of kind of accounting work, too. So I feel like I still kind of use those skills. Um, but I'm not actively working on those. Good questions. We got uh, another uh, couple questions here, Sister Wardha. Thank you again for for answering these. Sure. It's been awesome. Um, so the next question that uh, was asked uh, is, is specifically with respect to Polygon. Um, so yeah. uh, I was asking that in the five years, mashallah, of Polygon's existence and and going forward, um, how have you seen? the growth in engagement with the Muslim community since you started um, and uh, any trends that you've seen in demographic engagement? Has it has it been and still is primarily youth, uh, maybe from a specific ethnicity or have y'all seen that start to expand? Uh, what is that looking like or has that been looking like since Polygon's uh, uh, first years? That is a great question. Um, I honestly, it's been a mixed bag since we've started as far as demographics, as far as um, who attends, where the trainings happen. And I, that's been very promising to see. Um, so, you know, we'll start with kind of the communities that board members know directly, or sometimes people reach out and request a training. Um, I did several in Texas, actually, as well. And we do them in DC and California and all over. So, you know, we'll go to a mosque and there might, it might be a big Desi community that has a lot of aunties and uncles show up and some young people as well versus, you know, we do one here in DC with Muppies, which is a Muslim professional organization and it's all young people um, and of, of diverse backgrounds. So it really just depends on where we're at. I would say still a lot of young people probably are really interested in our work, but we have donors and supporters that are in the older generation as well because um, they will actually say things like, hey, you know, we've built enough mosques, it's time now to build political power. And so I'm like, yeah, right on, uncle. Like they, they get it that, you know, their generation spent time building these institutions, building the mosques, and, and those were absolutely necessary things for our community. Um, but at the same time, um, how are we making sure that our rights are protected here in the US? How are we making sure that we have equal access um, under the law and that we are, you know, being treated well and that our representatives actually represent us. So I think it's a slower shift. Um, you know, people will sometimes, even Muslim leaders will meet me or meet the organization. They'll be like, oh, where have you been? We've never met you. And it's like, we've been here. <laughs> You've just never uh, heard of us because we're, a, you know, we're, we have kind of a grassroots work as well as the national work that we do. Um, and we probably are the youngest people probably working in any Muslim organization, I'm trying to think, um, at least on the national level, where it's a lot of millennials um, that are on the board and running it. And, uh, you know, with that comes its own demographics that you bring along. So uh, I think it's been diverse. 
I think it's increasing inshallah. And um, yeah, I'm excited because even the Muslim community in the US is very diverse and very young too. So I'm really not bothered by that fact. Exactly, exactly. thank you. Um, and, we, and folks, we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, I've got one more that's here on, uh, that was sent to me here, but uh, sure. if, if anybody would like to drop one in the chat there. Um, one person uh, has just asked, it says like, uh, we, it, it's really impressive to see to see your bio. Uh, two part question: Where do you find time to do all of uh, the things that you are doing, uh, mashallah? And then the second part being that uh, knowing the Muslim community and how a lot of us go into uh, a lot of eight to five jobs or a lot of jobs that are on fixed schedules where we may not have the flexibility to do things during the daytime. What do you have any uh, or do you have any kind of recommendations for? what kind of like, uh, how, how we can start to engage uh, in our communities, given our limitations with our work lives uh, and how we can start to incorporate that even if we do have uh, a full-time job uh, and do this uh, on the off time. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, as far as how I find time, well, I mean, like I told you, I ended up changing careers so I could work on this full time, but even then, you know, um, right now, that was my boss calling from, from work that I'm going to call right after this. So there's a lot happening. Um, sometimes you're going to be busier than others. Like, for instance, Ramadan is a big month for us. We're always fundraising. Every Muslim organization is a big month for us, and we're just super, super busy. Um, other parts of the time, you know, we're not as busy or we're more constant. So it's always an ebb and flow. Um, but I think good time management skills are really important. I live and die by my calendar. If my meeting is not on the calendar. I'm not going to show up because I'm not going to remember. <laughs> so I, I have to use my calendar um, really well. I think also delegating tasks and not trying to do everything myself is really important. So, um, you know, if I build a good team around me, for instance, they can help support all the tasks that we're doing. And, and, and you're stronger than if you, it's just you yourself doing it. So I think I'm the oldest child in my family. I've I think that just comes as being the oldest child. You're very good at delegating tasks. So um, that's just something that comes kind of naturally to me. And it's really helpful when you're trying to accomplish things. And then also just looking for efficiencies in work. Um, so I mentioned, you know, uh, I you know, I work at the Office of Refugee Resettlement and I went in there and, you know, it's a government position. So there's a lot of inefficiencies that I see. So I'm like, why are you spending time sending this email every day to people when you could just upload it to Microsoft Teams and then give people a link once and they can just check it whenever they want. So it's thinking also tr strategically like that about like, how can I save time and be more efficient with my time? Um, and so that's kind of how I manage it. And as far as um, people who are working current eight to five jobs. Um, I was in your shoes. I was working at Deloitte when I was living in Houston. It was a consulting position. It was a demanding position. And that's why I was doing the work outside, right? So I was writing that religion blog. I was volunteering with the care office. Um, you know, I was visiting DC and trying to meet with like people, Muslims who worked in policy. Um, so, and I had that radio show that I was doing. So I tried to do as much as I can outside of work or on the weekends. And then it got to the point where I was like, wow, I'm spending all of my spare time doing this. I, I need to do this full time. And so I had the flexibility to do that. Not everybody has a flexibility to do that. And so that's when I say that things like even just signing up for our mailing list, like Polygon's mailing list, for example, and just getting an action alert and spending the two minutes it takes to fill out a form to send, you know, it's a pre-written form to send a message to your member of Congress. It makes a difference. And it only took you like two minutes and somebody already did all the work for you filling it out. So finding things like that. Um, People think that you have to be protesting in the streets all the time to make a difference. And that's part of it, but you don't have to do that if you don't have time or if you're unable to like spend your Saturday doing that. You can be writing a you know um, letter to your member of Congress. You can be making a two minute phone call. It literally only takes like a minute or two minutes to just uh, you know call them and say, this is my view. And they'll say, thank you and hang up. So finding little ways that you can do that um, is, is, is really helpful and you know volunteering for local organizations. People who take volunteers are happy for whatever hours you can provide. So if all you can do is help with one project, then they'll be really happy to take that. So I think the intention is really important, having the intention to help. And then from there, you can kind of figure out and starting local, like I said, is, is how I started it and not feeling like you have the world on your shoulders. Just like, what is it in my community that I can help with? What is it that needs to change? And, and where can I start? And finding like-minded people that can work with you. Um, I saw another question. 
agency. Yeah, since I'm you work closely, yes, since okay. you work closely with national and international government agencies, are there potentially new threats or negative trends? Do you see the Muslim community could have to deal with in the near future? Just looking for a heads up of what to prepare for. Um, I mean, I think we saw that a lot with the Trump administration. There was always kind of anti-Muslim, anti-immigrant policies and rhetoric coming around. I think with the current administration, it's more, I guess, business as usual. But as I wrote an article about this in the, in the beginning of the year, like business as usual is not going to cut it, right? The Muslim community wants more. We want better policies. Um, so I think that's kind of a challenge that I see is maybe challenging the way that things have always been done or are usually done and seeing how we can do them better and more equitable ways, um, I think is the challenge. You're not gonna see like overt Islamophobia from these agencies under this administration, but there are gonna be state and local groups that can do that, right? And so maybe watching things at the state and local level. I know previously, even before the Trump administration, there were anti-Sharia bills that would happen at the state level those could still happen. Anti-refugee bills that could still happen. Anti-immigration bills, things like that. So keeping an eye on those things that are always kind of a constant, regardless of which administration is in office, thinking about how Muslims are treated um, when it comes to higher levels of government or in agencies. Uh, I mean, just giving you the example yesterday uh, of yesterday of the Ilhan Omar bill and just how she's been treated. I think Muslims that kind of are in uh, public service positions are in like high positions, high profile positions like Congresswoman Omar is, and she's a visible Muslim, she's an immigrant, she's black, she's refugee, um, is, is the challenge that we're seeing now because now it's kind of come to a head where, you know, we don't support this um, sort of Islamophobia, um, but it's still happening. So yeah, there's, a, I think there's a lot of different challenges um, that we see. And that's just as Muslims continue to enter this field, um, hopefully it'll be easier for us as more and more of us are working in policy and advocacy, whether it's inside or outside government, and we can be a support for each other. But, you know, there are always challenges when minority communities um, enter a space where they traditionally haven't been. Thank you so much, Sister Wardla. And uh, for everybody for asking questions, I want to be mindful of time and for Sister Wardla's time for, for being here. Um, but we just dropped the uh, link for uh, Polygon into yes. the uh, chat there. So please do check uh, Polygon out uh, and support. And at least as Sister Wartha mentioned, just uh, just getting in the know um, and, and, and just, uh, you know, it's just a couple clicks uh, just to sign up for a newsletter. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, you can you can get get that, that process started there. But uh, again, I really want to thank you, Sister Wartha, for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, be here with us uh, in our community. Uh, tonight, and uh, I appreciate you having your Instagram handle and your contact up there because that was the next thing I was going to say. Uh, so I'm glad that it, there's a visual aid to that um, yeah. and, and for being here. And so uh, in closing, inshallah, I would just like to uh, let everyone know that inshallah we'll have our final uh, halakha next uh, next year. So it's real, it feels uh, weird saying that, but next year in 2022 in January, so Thursday, January 20th, We'll have our next halakha uh, at seven o'clock, and it'll be on environmental justice in Islam uh, with Sister Corey Majid, uh, whose work you can follow on Green Ramadan uh, Instagram at Green Ramadan. Uh, and so you can check that out for more information. But uh, again, thank you so much, Sister Wardo. It's been a thank blessing so here. And we're, this is just a pause in our conversation. We're definitely going to yeah, uh, no, see you in the future. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for everybody who actively participated and asked questions. I know I tend to talk really fast and throw a lot of information so you guys kept up really well, Mashallah. <laughs> and um, I'm so glad to um, have you guys interested in this topic that's so important for our community. So I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care. And Assalamualaikum. Take care. Assalamualaikum. Bye.